Welcome to the Destiny Church Tees Valley podcast. As you listen, it is our prayer that you are transformed by audacious faith, inspiring hope, and extravagant love. Well, good morning, everyone. Are you excited to be here? Okay, I was expecting a lot more passion than that. Are you excited to be here? Well, I hope I can get a bit of sympathy this morning. If you don't know, I've been at Scunthorpe this weekend with a team from Destiny helping at a kids' camp. This church had a big weekend, and they wanted their kids' workers to be involved. So they said, would you come help? I was like, kids, like, that's easy. Yeah, like, you fair hard. Kids, they listen to you. So I was like, we can do this. Then I got put on tots which was my biggest mistake of saying yes to. They had me wrapped around their finger. I was chasing them all weekend. But this morning, I am coffee, shot, espresso, Red Bull, excited to be here to preach with you a new series that we're starting called Living Beyond Yourself. Living Beyond Yourself. I think something that's so overrated, sorry, underrated in this life is intentionality having a purpose, having a goal, having something you're fixated on and investing all your time, all your energy, everything you have into this goal and into this purpose. We live in a world that is so busy. It's so chaotic. It's so stressful that we start wanting everything now. We want money now. We want fame now. We want a family now. We're not willing to work day in, day out, week in, week out to earn it. We actually, we just want things now. And this culture has shifted and moved into the church that we start finding ourselves saying things like, I just can't find a church that, that fits me. I can't find a church that, like, my giftings and my talents, like, th- this church just don't really use me. I, I can't find a church where I'm going to grow. And this me, myself, I, this culture shifts in. And the worst thing is we don't even batter an eyelid anymore. We're so used to it. And if we don't find a church that uses us, then we'll just move church. We'll just find somewhere else where we recognize quickly instead of serving until our time has come because we have this attitude of spiritual consumption instead of realizing that we are spiritual contributors. We need to realize that we don't come to church because this church doesn't exist for us. We're not here this morning for us. Actually, we are the church and we exist for the world. And we need to shift our mindset of being here this morning for us. We're in this church for us. We serve for us because everyone can hear my voice, because everyone can see what I'm good at. But actually, no, we are here for the world. And I believe this morning that as we step out of ourselves, of our life, of our job, of our family, of our friends, of our little circle that we seem to just dance around and we spend all our time in our little circle of my life. But what if for a second we just stepped out of the world that we created into the world that he created, what would happen? If we said, God, instead of letting me just see what I can see, let me see what you can see. Instead of just listening to what's around me, what can you hear? Instead of seeing what's in my heart, what's in your heart? I'm like, my little dance going on. But you know, what would happen if we stepped out of our world and into his world? We'll start to see schools that are covered in prayer. We'd start to see workplaces that we're just turning up to to make some money. That we'd start to see the light in those dark places. We'd start to see sicknesses healed. We'd start to see a community's needs being met. We'd start to see Jesus being spoken into a generation of depression and stress and anxiety and identity crises. I'm out of breath already. This is not great. For all those of you who maybe have not heard this exciting news, we got a new kettle this week. I wasn't going to tell a story, but it's come to me now, and I have the mic, so unfortunately, you're all going to find out about our new kettle. So our kettle broke. My dad was like, you don't know my dad. He strives for excellence. Everything he needs is excellence. He looks for a kettle. He thinks, what is the best kettle out there? He scours the internet all day, all night. I don't know how long it took him. I made that up. But he probably spent a long time looking for this kettle. 
and I walked into the kitchen to see the stew kettle in the shimmering glory, the halo that I embarked on. I thought, wow, I need to test out this kettle. I get my favorite mug, my favorite tea bag, if that's a thing. I get my, my one, maybe three sugars. I put them in the kettle. I'm all ready. I go to turn the kettle on, and I realize I don't actually know how to work this kettle. My dad had told me that this kettle, it, it lights up, it sings, it, 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 just, it entertains you while it boils. But actually, as I'm having a disco in my kitchen, I realize I don't know how to actually make it warm. I don't actually know how to make it boil this water. And actually, as I stood there, I thought, that's a bit like the church. We're so entertained by the lights that flash. We're so entertained by the music we're here. But have we got a spirit that's on fire for God? At the center, are we boiling hot? Are we crying out for a revival? At the center, are we saying, God, move here? Or are we just all about what's on the exterior? Are we just dancing along aware that inside we've gone stale? That inside we've died down a little bit? Because I believe that as we step out of our world and into his world and ask God to revive us from the inside, ask God to give us a new passion, give us a new spirit that is hungry, then we start to say enough is enough. You know what? En enough is enough. I don't want to see homeless people anymore. I want to help them. I enough is enough. I don't want to see school children who have never heard about Jesus. I'm going to go in and do some school work. Enough is enough. I don't want to see this kids camp have to not happen because I haven't got the volunteers. Enough is enough. I'm going to have a whatever it takes attitude. Whatever is required of me, whatever it takes attitude. The Bible is full of people who allowed apathy to steal their destiny. They just allowed this complacency, they just this day-to-day -day living this normality, ripped them and stole from them what God had planted. But as well, the Bible is also full of people who found breakthrough because they had this whatever it takes attitude. Why don't you turn to your neighbor and say, whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. I did that just so I could catch my breath. This morning, I want to talk to you from the book of John, chapter 13. And this is, Jesus is just about to leave the disciples. And before he leaves, I think there's one thing he can tell them. He's one last thing he can show them. He knows he's going to go. He knows he spent all these years teaching them and training them. But he thinks, if there's one last thing that I could just leave with you. If this is the last thing that you could be in the fresh in your memory, this is what I want it to be. John chapter 13, it says, Just before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. Skipping down to verse 11, it says, um, for he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You called me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is who I am. Now that I am your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set for you an example that, should, that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the, the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. This morning, I want to talk to you from the title, Towel Over Title. Towel Over Title. Do you want to pray with me? Jesus, we just thank you for the opportunity we have to be here in your presence. None of us deserve it. 
Sometimes we take it for granted, but we thank you that you turn up even when our hearts aren't right. And we just pray that this morning you will have your way. Move what needs to be moved in our life. Speak what needs to be said. Change what you don't like, God. I pray that today you will be pleased with us. I pray that today you will have your way with us. Speak afresh. Whisper to us. Amen. Amen. I want to start from point number one, which is you are saved by service. You are saved by service. When I first said this point to my dad, he's like, no, 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 this is all wrong. You're not saved by service. I was like, no, no, no. One minute. We're not saved by our service. We're not saved by what we do, but we are saved by his service. We're, sa- we're saved by a God who in Psalm 18.35, it says he so- stooped down from the highest place to the lowest place. Why? To make you great. We serve a God who give completely of himself. He said, I can't stay high up here. I need to come down and save you, although you don't deserve it. Even though I know you will ignore me sometimes. Even though I know you can never repay me. Even though I know you're going to hurt me and you're going to push me away and all you're going to fail and all these things that I, I already know you're going to do. I still look at you and I still think, you're worth it. And we serve a God who all knows everything about us, yet says you're worth it. He looks at us and he says, although you're weak, I want to use my power to serve you. He says, although you're tired, I want to use myself to refresh you. He says, although you may feel uh, like, you've, like you've messed up and you've sinned, I want to use my forgiveness to restore you. He is a God who wants to serve us. He's a God who has served us, does serve us, and always will serve us. He's a God who loves us, and he gives of himself for our benefit. He doesn't get anything from it. He just wants to lavish his love upon us. Jesus came and he said, I have come to serve, not be served. His whole attitude, even though he was the greatest of all, he says, I, even the greatest, have come to serve. And when Jesus comes to serve, he shows us a posture that we as the church should have. When he comes to wash feet, he shows us the posture that we should have for our ministries the posture that we should have for our families, the posture we should have for our workplaces and our schools, this posture of humbling yourself down so not that you are great, but so that he is great. See, Jesus has only ever seen doing what the Father does. So when Jesus washes feet, he's saying, my Father washes feet. God washes feet. You know, I'm not doing this because I want to. I'm doing this because this is what my Father does. Maybe sometimes you don't fancy getting into this posture. Maybe when you have a row with your spouse, but you say, not because I feel like it, but because this is what my father does. Not because I feel like going down to this bully at school, but because this is what my father does. Not because I feel like serving that person who was gossiping about me, but because this is what my father does. We have this attitude of service, not because that's what we feel like, but that's because, what, because that's what God does. He serves us, and our response should be to serve him. You know, sometimes we find Christians who like to say, well, God's given me everything, and I could never repay that, so why try? Like, I, like he's given me so much, I could never give that back to him, so I'll just enjoy what he's given me. Well, I could never repay my earthly parents back, for all the sleepless nights when I was crying as a baby. I could never repay them back for the advice they've given me over the years. I could never repay them back for the endless meals that I have eaten from their kitchen and crisps particularly. I could never repay them back the nights that they just encouraged me. I could never repay them for all the prayers they've said over me. I could never repay them for anything they've done for me, but that doesn't stop me trying. That doesn't stop me loving them. That doesn't say, well, you know what? You've done all this for me. Thanks, but um, I think, uh, I think I'll, I'll just, I'm not going to enter the dishwasher. I think um, I'm not going to help you do anything because what's the point? We have this attitude of because you so love me, I want to love you. 
So point number one, we are saved by service. And because we are saved by service, this brings us on to point number two, you are called to service. You are called to service. Jesus commands us to do the same. He says, this example that I am giving you is what I'm commanding you to go and do to the rest of the world. He says, this example that I'm being, it's not just an idea for you to contemplate. He's saying, this is a life that I'm calling you to live. See, so often we start to think we can outgrow service. The higher up we go, the higher our position, the bigger of our title we get. We don't have to serve anymore. We have people who do that. But serving is never beneath you. Your position, your title, it will never be above service. You are always called to serve. It's just interesting how now we have such a, a, a culture which is set on leadership. We have so many leadership conferences. Every time you talk to someone, they want to lead something. I've never heard of a servant conference. I've never heard people go, actually, I just, I just want to be a great servant. But even Jesus, who is the greatest leader of all, never spoke about leadership. He spoke about servanthood. Because you don't become a leader and then learn to serve. You serve, and that gives you influence. You, it's, the, it's the other way around. When you serve, that's what lifts you up, not lifting yourself up and then serving. So when Jesus came to serve his disciples, he took off what was on him. He took off what was on him. He humbled himself down. He said, he took off his jacket. And I feel like this morning, I thought, what, what is it that we need to take off? What is it that's stopping us from serving, that if we just got rid of it, we'd be a bit more free to serve? What is it that's holding us back? Is it that bitterness? Is it that jealousy? Is it that comparison? Is it something that someone said 20 years previously, but we've had it nursing? We've had people talk to us about it again and again and again, but we still just hold on to it. Is it complaining? Is it that attitude of it being about me? Is it the attitude of this church isn't right for me? Is it some plan, some dream? What is it for you that you think, I need to just take this off? This for me, this is what's holding me back. I need to just take it off and lay it to the side. And as he led it to the side, he then swapped it for a towel. He laid aside what gave him the title and he picked up the towel and he found himself in a position to serve. For those of you this morning who are in a season of waiting, for those of you who feel like there's some things that you're just you're praying about, that you're seeking God about, let me tell you, we need to change how we wait. We so often went, right, God, I'm ready when you are. Like, I know your time is perfect, but like, any time now would be great. Um, so yeah, so like, I'll just, I'll just stand here. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Maybe here. Is this where I'm supposed to be? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Wait, what? Okay. I'll just, I'll just, just waiting. You know, season of waiting. What can I do? Just, is he going to reply? Who really knows? And they, actually, God says, when you pick up your towel, this is how you wait. When you wait upon people, will you start to put your heart into the position of service. And as you serve people, you, you change your heart so you're ready to hear God. When you change your heart from me, 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 and myself, and I, and change it to thinking about others, then you've got a heart that God can work with. Then you've got a heart that God can change because although we want things now and instant, and God can give things now and instant, salvation is instant, but transformation, that's a process. That requires a season of waiting. That requires a season of work. That requires time. The renewing of yourself from the inside out, that will be a process that you need to just serve. That you need to say, you know what, although I'm waiting, although I don't feel change, although I still think about this the same, but God, as I serve, will you renew my mind? God, although I, I still feel like I'm being overlooked and people just aren't seeing this gift and that I've got, as I serve, will you, will you help me to find the ministry that it is I'm supposed to be in? God, I'm struggling with this marriage and I'm praying and I'm praying for breakthrough, but as I serve my spouse, will you just help bring restoration into that? As we serve, God will then serve you. I want to talk as well about Judas. So of course, when you talk about Judas, 
you have to ask Emma to come and help volunteer. I was like, Emma, don't be offended, but I'm going to do an analogy. I need Judas. Would you be Judas? She was still slightly offended. <laughs> I'll make it up to her afterwards. Chocolate wins. See, the crazy thing about Jesus is when he was washing the disciples' feet, he didn't wash all the disciples, but then just skip Judas. He didn't wash all the disciples, but then think, they're, they're going to betray me. It says in the Bible he knew at this point that Judas was going to betray him. Don't know if I just said it. He knew at this point, just in case you were confused. I saw Rachel taking a photograph. I thought we need to be Insta ready. <laughs> just in case, well, I forgot what I was saying. Dude, Jesus never skipped Judas because he knew what was going to happen. Are you disciplined enough to serve whoever God tells you to, if they're inside or outside your cliff? Because anybody can serve someone they respect. But can you serve somebody who you look down upon? Can you serve someone who you think doesn't deserve respect? Can you serve someone who you know is going to betray you? Because Jesus knew what was on the outside. He knew Jesus, that Judas was going to betray him. But he never let what was on the outside change what was on the inside. We need to stop going around like horses with blinders on because if, I hope it's not crying, because if Jesus, because if Jesus ever revealed to you what a person was like, it would stop you, how you, it would change how you treated them. It would stop you serving. We need a culture that says, you know what? I know you're going to betray me, but I'll serve you. I know later on you're going to gossip about me, but I still want to serve you. I know later on you're going to hurt me and we're not going to be friends anymore. I know later on you might leave me. I know later on, even though you're my child and I've given to you all these years, you might have a grudge against me. I don't care what it is you're going to do. I've seen what it is you're going to do, but that doesn't change how I'm going to treat you. That doesn't change what it is I'm going to do. I'm going to maintain focus on what it is that I've been called to do, regardless of who it is I've been called to do it to. See, servanthood as a spirit of faithfulness. Servanthood has a spirit. Sorry, <laughs> I knew I had this for a reason. <laughs> servanthood has a spirit of faithfulness. We need a church that has the attitude of, I can do that. I can do that. You know, that one's mine. You know, this kids club, like looking after kids like pouring juice. I can do that. You know, those toilets need cleaning. This, this, this room needs hoovering. You know, I can do that. That one's mine. You know what? Like someone needs to help count the offering. We need people to play piano. Like I can do that. That one's mine. Back to this whatever it takes attitude. We need this to be in the church. That instead of us trying to find volunteers, we're trying to uh, we're trying to minimize volunteers. There's too many. We don't need this many people. We need like we need good problems to have. We need people that have a I can do that. That one's mine. That before the job's even suggested, someone's doing it. We need people that are hungry, that are ready to serve, that they don't need to be asked to serve because God has already called them to serve. We are, caught, we are saved by service. We are called to service. And number three, with a heart of sincerity. With a heart of sincerity. See, when Jesus turns up to this meal, all the disciples at this point are arguing about who's the greatest. Who is the great? Am I the greatest? Whose title is better? Whose position is better? They're quarreling about who's the greatest of them all. And Jesus walks in, quite obviously being the greatest of them all, and says, I'll show you who's the greatest. In the kingdom, the, the greatest is the one who serves. The greatest is the one who humbles themselves down. Greatness in the kingdom is not about title or position. It's about your attitude and your posture. You cannot serve what you do not love. Some of you this morning just need to fall back in love with Jesus. You just need to spend time today just rediscovering why it is that you love Jesus remembering what it is that he's done for you because you've been a Christian maybe for such a long time. It's just become something that you say, your story is just something you say to your colleagues when you've got a quick five minutes. But actually, how much he's brought you through is something you need to remind yourself of. 
You need to fall back in love with Jesus because your heart will direct your life. It's not your head and your decisions, but it's your heart. Because in the Bible, it says, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Everything you do flows from your heart, which is why the enemy is always trying to put a wedge between your head and your heart. If he can just change your heart, if he could grab a hold of your heart, he then also grabs a hold of your head. He's grabbed a hold of your feet. He's grabbed a hold of your hands. He's got a hold of everything that you're going to do. We need a church that is not interested in titles, but is interested in towels. We don't serve for our ego. We don't serve to receive praise. If no one says thank you, that's fine because we're not serving for you. We, if no one takes a picture and Instagrams it, that's fine because I'm not serving for Instagram. I'm not serving to look good. I'm not serving for myself. I'm serving because he first served me. What would look different if you served? What would change if you served? You see, how we all serve will look different. What you're called to serve in and what I'm called to serve in are different. But we all need to be willing to do everything. We need a heart that says, I will do anything. I will serve anywhere. I will help out with anything, regardless of if I think hoovering is my calling or not, I'll serve. However, how how we serve in our main time might look different. You might be called to kids' work. You might be called to the homeless. You might be called to preaching. I'm sorry, I can't explain to my head, but that's what I was doing. What we do is different. Esther's looking at me, I'm thinking, Mark, you should definitely cover your ears at this point. When we went away this weekend, <laughs> there was a couple of us. I, wo- I said I would not name names, so for this analogy, we will call the person Ben. And when we went away, Esther asked Ben to go and get something from the car. And when Ben went to the car, he opened the boot. He did as he was supposed to get. He then, obviously, this is what everyone does, is put the car keys in the boot, close the boot. Because Esther has an automatic lock, the keys were locked inside the car. Ben's like, oh, no. <laughs> Like, I've come here for a few weeks. How have I managed to do this? So Ben comes in and is like, Esther, like, don't freak out, which is the worst thing to say to Esther because she's already freaking out at this point. <laughs> she's like, she, he's like, I've, I went to go get out of the car where you asked for, but I accidentally put the, the keys in the boot and I didn't realize it would lock automatically. And I showed, basically, your keys are locked in the car. And obviously, we all know Esther. Ah, no, my keys. So Esther's like panicking. We all come out, the troop of us, young adults. I'm like, guys, I got this, but we're going to pray. We all lay hands on the car. We're like, come on, Jesus, we're speaking in tongues. I don't know, we're in every language going. We're like, I'm like, guys, this is going to be an awesome illustration for Sunday. We've got this. And we're, pr- we're laying hands. And you'd never guess what happened. It didn't open. I was like, Jesus, why do you not answer prayer? Like, I was like, I was storming and face like the dean now is not the time to question god like we just need to open the car and so i was like so i was like right young adults what do young adults do when we're in trouble we phone a real adult so we phoned <laughs> my dad my dad comes along he's like right guys there's a garage across the road we're about four steps away from it why have you not gone to the garage he's like esther i'm coming with you we walk across we're egging each other come on esther we can do this right we're gonna all we've got to do is say look right yeah we've got this we know what we're gonna say esther i'm doing the talking right so we go <laughs> We walk in, it's very clear we didn't know where we were going, walking around the sky, like, hello, hello. We walk in, and someone says, hello, I'm like, hello, my angel. You will save my day, I am confident of it. I was like, well, just across the road, we've, we've locked our car keys in the car, I was wondering if you could just help me. And he was instantly like, no, like, sorry, like, no, there is nothing I can do. But behind, a guy naively showed interest. He said, oh, what car is it? I thought we've got you. You are our guy. You're going to do it. We turned around. We said, a black one. He said, what year is it? We were like, 2019. Like, what a stupid question. We then realized he meant the car. We were like, we don't know. So we were like, right, it's like four steps away. Come on, we can do this. So we, come on. Me and a, he's like six foot eight. He was running. Me and Esther were like, well, come on. Like, this, this car, this car, there's a lot of black ones. We, we forgot which one it was. But like, the one where everyone's laying hands on, that one. Like. So we found the car. 
He comes with all of his tools. We were definitely scared at this point. He was talking about which window to break in. We were like, oh no. He was like, this one will cost 250 pounds. So I was like, don't tell Mark. We can't tell Mark. Let's just see how far we can get before we have to tell Mark. We've, we're gonna cost him a lot of money this weekend. So this guy comes, we're all besides ourselves. I mean, we all stand around him, like staring in, like no pressure to this guy. And he like, he's bending this window, trying to like break in. I was going in the church, like has anyone got a pass? Like, like, come on, is there anyone who knows how to break in cars? You're needed right now. And so I was just wishing that they weren't saved so they would help us. And so we were trying to get into this car. I mean, I don't know how long it was, I'll say 20 minutes, maybe for the pur purpose of the story, we'll say an hour to make it sound more dramatic. And I mean, by this point, I'd gone in, I was getting pizza. I was like, leaving you all to it, pizza's out. But um, so after about 20 minutes, this guy manages to break into the car, wind the window down and open the door to get the keys. He saved the day. He didn't even want any money. He was like, give it to charity. I was like, am I charity? Like, <laughs> and so, and you know, at this moment I thought, this just shows what God's like. When we are at the heart of service, when we said, you know what, we're going to go to this church and we're going to serve. When you have the heart and the posture of service, then when the issues come, God places people around you that will help. When, when issues come, God will place people around that can help that resolve it. That it's like when when your heart's in the right place, doors will swing open that when your heart's in the wrong place, you will be forcing down. God has called us to have a heart of sincerity. A heart of sincerity looks like two things. It looks like integrity, having nothing to prove and nothing to hide, having integrity and having gratitude. Gratitude is a decision. It says in the Bible about, um, I will give thanks and be glad in it. Not I feel like giving thanks and be glad in it. I will. It's a decision I've made that no matter what the situation is like, I have decided I will be thankful. I have decided I will be grateful because what your mouth says, there your heart is. Your mouth speaks what the heart is full of. So what is the song over your life? What do you find yourself saying? because that's what your heart is full of. So we have to make a decision to control our tongue because as we control what we say, we start to rewrite the song that is directing our life. We need a song that is full of thanksgiving, a song that is full of love, a song that is full of passion. See, whatever you entertain in life, whatever vocabulary you use, whatever the attitude of walking into a room is like you're doing God a favor for turning up, whatever you entertain with what you watch and what you listen to, that determines your heart. That determines who you're going to become. That determines where you're going. We need a church that has an attitude of, I am serving is not what I do, it's who I am. Turn to someone near you and say, servant is who I am. As I come to a close, I want to just remind us all that the church, we are a body of Christ. We've got some arms, we've got some legs, we've got some feet, we've got some eyes, uh, whatever else is in a body. We've got everything. <laughs> But the issue is when you do not serve, the body is missing a part. When you do not serve the, the mission of the body, it's, it's missing something. God has called you to contribute something. And if you're not doing it, then something God has called to happen is not being done. We are called to contribute. We are called to input into the mission, you see, because the church does not have a mission. Because if the church had a mission, that would mean God created the church and then thought of a mission to have the church. God had a mission and then created the church. God had a mission and then created the church, which means that the church is the mission. The church, you and me, we are the mission of God. We are the people he has placed to go and live out his assignment. The mission 
has a church. The mission has you. So this morning, as I've spoken, I I, I don't want to speak and then for us to move on and, and ask the worship team to come back up. So I've asked them just to stay seated. And I want us to I want to ask you a question of how can you serve? What is it that God's calling you to serve in? How can you serve your spouse? How can you serve your family? How can you serve the church? How can you serve your serve your community? What is it that God's called you to serve in? I'm going to play a video and I want us to think about what it is that God's called us to serve in. You see, the thing about serving is I don't want us to think lightly, like, oh, I guess one week I guess I could do when that'll be me done, I've served. We're talking about a servant that invests your whole life. When Jesus took off his coat, the word they use is tithemi, tithemi. It's a weird word to use when you're just taking off a coat because it actually means to take off everything you are to give up everything you are it's the same word that he used when he said I'll give up my life on the cross when Jesus knelt down to wash the feet he's showing the same love and the same giving of himself as he did when he was on the cross so this morning when I ask what are you going to serve in I'm saying what are you going to give your life to what are you going to give all your time to all your money to all of your family is going to get involved what is it that you are called to do that is going to give completely of yourself what is it that you are being asked to do so we're going to listen to this song we're going to do the tithes and offering as well while the song is on and I'd like you just to sit and think about what you're being called to serve and if you want to write on the communication cards that'd be great we'd love to just get around you as a church and cheer you on and support you and partner with you to do this But just have a think and have a prayer and let God whisper to you what it is that he's calling you to do. You know, while we we were just listening to that, I felt God prompt me to speak to the parents for a moment. You see, there's some parents here who are discouraged with the children. Maybe not coming to church. Maybe they feel like they're not loving Jesus. Maybe they just feel like they're having a battle with the kids at the moment. You see, growing up in church, I've seen a lot of people who have come to church, a lot of families who have brought kids to church. I've seen a lot of people turn away from Jesus, and I've seen a lot of kids stick in the church. And I believe there's two things which keep children planted in the house. The first thing is parents who serve. They need role models to watch who give themselves to serve. I watched my parents serve in the good times and in the bad times. I watched them serve when it was the hardest thing they've ever done and when it was the best thing they've ever done. I watched my parents give of themselves passionately every day. I watched them invest in their relationship with Jesus. Your kids will be able to tell if you're just turning up to church or whether you're excited to come to church. Your kids will be able to tell whether church is not just something you do, but it's who you are. Your kids can tell whether your relationship with Jesus is authentic and genuine. They need role models. And second of all, you need to get your kids to serve in church. They need to see you serve, but they need to serve. Because when they start serving, they start to feel valued. When they start serving, they start to feel needed. They start to feel like they belong. When they start serving, they stop attending church and start becoming the church. We need to encourage all of our youth all of our kids, no matter how young they are, little Malachi is gorgeous. He helps every week set up and pack down. That little, he has his own little steward's badge. He melts my heart. Every kid, no matter how old or how young they are, they can serve. They can serve. Let's pray. God, I thank you for the word that you've spoken today. I thank you for the challenge you may have given us. I thank you for the encouragement some other people may have received. God, I pray that today it's not just a word that you've whispered that we leave, but a word that we grab a hold of and we put into our life and instill it into our very being. God, we pray today for a revival in this church in this community, in this, the UK, God, we pray that we will see something beyond ourselves start to happen. That as we step out of our world and into your world, we'll see lives 
change? Was he hope bound? God, break through here, break through now, God, and we just pray that we would see miracle after miracle. I pray, God, for people who need to have a further conversation about this, that you'll prompt them to do that. God, but I pray that as we all go home, we'll take this serving attitude with us and serve our workplaces and our schools and our neighbours and our families and our spouses. Amen. If you would like to know more, please visit us at www.thedestinychurch.co.uk.